CERN basher is here. Hi, CERN. Hi, Randy. How are you? I know, I know I'm acting very serious compared to normal. CERN tells me that this is a very amazing presentation, his best ever. I know that's setting him up for failure. Whoops. <laughs> 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 but he's going to be talking about societal implications of robotaxi. We're not just talking about how much money is it going to put in your pocket when the stock goes to 2000. We're not just talking about how nice it's going to be for you to be able to read a book or, or text or play a game while you're uh, being driven by your electronic chauffeur. We're not just talking about all those comforts that are kind of going to come to you. We're talking about major societal implications. So, did I get that right, sir? You did, and you just covered the entire presentation. So, oh, we can just yes, there. never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I'm turning it over to you. This is the shortest video we've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I'd like to talk about the implications of a future robotaxi network. And we may still be a little bit early in this, but clearly, this is something that is coming our way. Okay. Uh, Tesla has announced that they're going to unveil the RoboTaxi network on August 8th this year. Right. So um, it's not quite two weeks, but it's close. <laughs> um, so yeah, today I'd like to talk about the first, second, and third order effects. Um, maybe not exactly in that order, but but just to try to think about some different levels of what this might mean. Okay. Okay. So the first one is let's think about a, a little bit about where the robotaxi network is going to be uh, set up initially. Um, I've actually shared this little image with you before on one of our previous shows in terms of where half of the country lives. And of course, the major metropolitan areas are where you know half of the people in the country are. Sure. They are are 333 cities in the United States that have more than 100,000 people. Okay. So you would definitely start there. There are 55 metro areas in the United States that have more than 1 million. So it would be logical, I think, to start probably in one or more of those 55 metro areas. Okay, the, the largest of which is uh, New York with about 20 million people in the metro area. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles is about 13 million. Uh, Chicago at about 10. Uh, Dallas, Houston, Atlanta in the 6 to 7 million range. Uh, and then followed closely by Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Miami, Phoenix, Boston area. So those are likely candidates in my mind for where you would initially set it up. In Tesla's case, they also need to consider where the vehicles are. And of course, as we know, California is the most Tesla concentrated state in the nation. Sure. So I would be shocked if the initial robotaxi network was not set up somewhere in California. Okay. Florida and Texas are also good initial starting points because there's lots of Teslas in those markets. And also it's a pretty good, good climate in mm -hmm. which to operate a robotaxi network year round without having to worry about snow and those kinds of things. Right. Okay. So to me, it's likely in the South, um, Atlanta might be another good market and so on. So we'll see what they announce and how many cities that they start with, but that would be my thoughts on the initial rollout. Okay. Okay. All right. The first implication is that this is a monumental change for the business model of Tesla. We've been talking about this now for a long time. Um, this is Brent Winton from ARC. And I thought he had a nice little succinct way of sort of showing people how much this changes Tesla's business model. So if Tesla sells a $25,000 car, then they might make you know $2,500 in income once. But if you deploy a robotaxi at $1 per mile, then they calculate that could be about $25,000 in income annually. Mm -hmm. So right there in one year, it's already a 10x improvement in the income potential. Okay. And he's saying that one robotaxi is worth 50, 25,000 K car sales on a present value basis. 
So whether that order of magnitude is right or not, 50 times, it's obviously a, a sea change in the way the business model works for Tesla sure. in terms of the opportunity. Now, this is not an overnight change. This is something that they grow into over time. But that's why so many people are excited about the potential for a robo-taxi network. Right. Okay. Now, the fifth, the one dollar per mile is kind of interesting. It might take Tesla a little while to get down to that level. And um, but it's interesting though the numbers that he came up with about twenty five thousand dollars per vehicle per year is actually very consistent with the numbers that that I've been talking about. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if somebody out there is looking for validation that Brett Winton knows what he's talking about, then I can I can give that that validation. Remind us that twenty five thousand dollars per year per car is that to be split between Tesla and the car owner and or any distributor like an Uber, or is that all in Tesla's pocket? That's a good question. It depends on what model Tesla opts for. In the model that I'm showing here, this is Tesla only. This would be the Tesla fleet. Yes. So to the extent that this is an owned car, it would be a split between Tesla and the owner. And if there's a Uber in the middle, it might be a three-way split. Could There could be. Okay. Now, this is a model where I got uh, $1 per mile and at only 30% utilization, I get to $25,000 right. a year profit. Right. So, and what I've done here is as you increase the utilization, I can decrease the cost per mile. So at 65% utilization at 45 cents a mile, I get to $28,000. Right. But you're right, this is Tesla only. This is probably down the road. I think Tesla actually is more likely to have a hybrid model where it's the Ubers of the world, it's individual owners, it's Tesla with some of their own vehicles. Right. But over time, I think competitive pressures may lead Tesla more and more to go it alone. Hmm. Over a longer period of time, it might be 20 years. Right. Uh, that's certainly where the greater profit potential is. But I think more than that, it gives Tesla the, a greater opportunity to drive down the cost. Uh huh. Because you're not sharing the pie with as many people. And this is, of course, a U.S. model, too. It's going to be a lot different in India, China, et cetera. Absolutely. Now, James Dalma uh, recently uh, posted um, about the Chicago area for rideshare. So the first thing, again, one of the first order effects, it's going to undercut rideshare. And we'll get to the public transportation side of this in a second. But in terms of rideshare, James took a look at the data from Chicago. And uh, he, he posted about this. And he said that if Tesla just matched what Uber and Lyft are getting in Chicago, mm -hmm. right, which is, um, I think it's about $2.40 per mile in revenue, actually it's shown here on this table. Okay. Okay. And he's got cost per mile of about 28 cents, but there's miles that you drive where you don't get revenue. So it's about 42 cents a mile in cost. Mm -hmm. So it's about $1.98 in net income or an income. Right. And so he's showing that on a vehicle, you, you could conceivably earn over $100,000 a year. Right. If they just matched what Uber and Lyft were charging in Chicago. And he did a present value on that of about $840,000. Yeah. Okay. So, again, this goes back to our previous discussion a few weeks ago about how used Tesla has become quite valuable. And we'll, we'll discuss mm -hmm. that in this presentation as well. But e even if Tesla doesn't undercut Uber, the profitability potential here is huge. There's certainly plenty of room and ability for Tesla to undercut Uber and make plenty of money and also expand the market at the same time. Mm -hmm. But just to dive a little bit deeper into the Chicago situation for rideshare, um, I also have downloaded the data and I've just begun to look at it. So these are some really rough charts and I apologize for the formatting. It's pretty terrible. But for one mile trips, the cost per mile is about $7.50. Mm. For five mile trips, the cost per mile is about two fifty. Okay, And then you can see as you go along and as this is increasing by one mile, um, the average cost is about $1.25 per mile. Wow. Okay. But most of the trips are in that shorter range. In Chicago's, uh -huh. you know, in the downtown area, you're not going that far. Sure. 
Right. And you can see from this previous heat map, most of the trips are in that downtown area. Right. Um, there's a lot of fluctuation per day in demand. This is looking at over an eight day period. Mm -hmm. And you can see the peaks and valleys in terms of the number of trips right. per hour per day. So there's a lot of, of complication to operating a robo taxi fleet. You have to make sure the vehicles are available and in position at the right times during the day where the demand is. Mm -hmm. Right. Uber and Lyft are pretty good at that by now. They've had years of experience in, in positioning vehicles. Um, so that that will be something for Tesla to overcome if they don't partner with an Uber or Lyft. Yeah, or and, both. and uh, I don't use Uber a ton, but I would say on average, I'm looking at a six or seven minute wait. Yeah. That's probably what I Now, would. I would imagine the Tesla will have the ability for you to, uh, like you do on Uber and Lyft, pre-reserve a vehicle for a certain right. time. Right. And actually, you'd probably be encouraged to because that makes it even easier for them to position vehicles. Of course. Yeah. Okay. So then if we break out the average price per mile in 15 minute intervals by trip length, so you can see for the really short trips, the cost per mile is very high. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at a minimum about 350 and a maximum, you know, seven or eight dollars per mile effectively. Okay. Now, some of these spikes are probably due to periods where there's high demand after, you know, a, a basketball game or hockey game or something like that, right? Where there's suddenly huge demand for a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then you can see as the average trip length lengthens, that fluctuation is not as great and the cost comes down. So the 15 plus miles is the red line and that's far more steady in terms of cost per mile. Okay. okay. All right. And then um, if you share the ride or don't share. So a lot of people say, you know, RoboTax is going to be too expensive. Well, if you share it, it'll be half the cost. Right. If you share it three or four ways, you can drive down that cost per person to a very, very low level. So this is where it becomes a threat to public transportation, mm -hmm. potentially over time. Okay. We'll talk about that more in a second. Okay. Um, we're seeing that with Uber and Lyft, that if you share the ride, the cost comes down there too of course that just makes sense all right this is work uh, that arc invest has done and they've determined that the existing right hail market is a 34 billion dollar opportunity at two to four dollars per mile so that's a decent sized market yeah but if you can get the the cost to the consumer down to a dollar a mile then you're unlocking at another trillion dollars of market opportunity and if you can get the non-commuting miles in higher income countries priced at 60 cents a mile, you're unlocking a mere 2.4 trillion of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if you can get the, what they call long tail of demand priced at human driven ride hail prices of 50 cents per mile in lower income countries, that's another two and a half to 3 trillion of opportunity. And then finally the, the super long tail stuff, the low cost accessible autonomous travel at 25 cents a mile, you know, years from now, that's another five trillion market opportunity. So, so, so they were they were uh, looking at these cost advantages only impact these. In other words, when you get it down to these low costs, they were thinking this would only be in uh, low income countries because wouldn't it have as much or more of an effect in a high income country? Yeah, I think they've got the higher income countries on this left side, and then you you finally get, you unlock the markets in lower income countries at lower price points. But yes, to the extent that we have this here too, that would, that would be fantastic. You'd have 100% of people using it probably at that point because it's so yeah, cheap. Right. Right. But even without that, you know, 60 cents a mile, for example, you get a big market opportunity. Yeah, I, I've thought about it for my own purposes because I've, as I've mentioned on my channel before, I now I, we are now a one car family because uh, I just don't have that much use case. But what about you know, as I contemplate, say, going uh, the beach is about fifty miles from here, so going to the beach, if it's going to cost me twenty five dollars for fifty cents a mile, is a lot different than if it's twenty five cents a mile and only costs twelve fifty. My choice, my decision, you know, 
might be one way or the other as I as I think about those two things. If it's 50 miles each way, that's a that's a really significant decision. Probably going to wait until an opportunity to go in the car we own and not get you know and continue to own a car. Um, so these these are yeah. going to be significant in in the real in the uh, first world nations as well. That's right. And there's other factors too. We're going to talk about those, but it's also what can you do with your time while you're not driving? Right. Right. And so is that of value to you besides just the cost of what it might you know, cost you? You might actually want to pay more I see. because now what you can do, right? You can take a nap on the way to the beach all of a sudden. Sure. That may be more appealing than having to fight traffic and then find parking once you're there. Right. If you don't have to worry about that stuff, traveling to the beach might be a lot more enjoyable and you might actually be willing to pay more to get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah okay so big opportunity and in, in terms of public transportation one of the big issues today with public transportation is not that it's too expensive it's that when you want to go from point a to point b you have to go to c d e and f to get there in, in the meantime it's not a direct trip right right you got to walk to the bus stop take a bus walk to the train station from the bus drop off point, wait for the train. If you miss that train, you got to wait for the next one. It's a whole journey. And so a lot of people would opt, I think, for the, the direct route, even if it might cost them a little bit more. So it is a threat to transportation. And then particularly as the price drops, it becomes a bigger and bigger threat to public transportation services. Yeah, so just in terms of public transportation, uh, it's an opportunity to uh, take some share away from there because it would be far more convenient to take a robo taxi from point A to point B rather than all the points in between that you might have to take when you take tr public transportation. Oh, yeah, you might have to walk. We're talking significant amounts of time. Uh, I have a couple of of uh, of friends uh, over the years who only use public transportation and it can take an hour to go what in an automobile would be 15 minutes. Um, so yeah, it can, it can be really significant. That's right. And then the other thing too, Randy is uh, school buses. Um, a lot of parents, you know, have challenged with bus transportation. The problem is a lot of kids, particularly after school need to go from the school to somewhere else, not necessarily to home. Uh huh. And the school bus doesn't take them to their sporting event. Right. Right. Or their dance class or whatever it might be. So having a robo taxi pick up the kids at school and then even perhaps even coming home and picking up a parent and then going to that activity, mm -hmm. that might be really appealing. Right. And then, of course, for any kids that find themselves bullied on a school bus, that also might be a very appealing. <laughs> yeah. So. In terms of public transportation, the map on the left is the New York City subway system. And you can certainly see that, you know, if you want to get from point A to point B anywhere on this map, the subway might be a good option, but it also might be a terrible option. So there's an opportunity. And then the one on the top right is Tokyo, a very highly efficient, you know, effective subway system. But even there, there may be opportunities. And then in the lower right, if you have cities where there isn't a subway, this is Las Vegas and they're building boring tunnels. Right. So put the autonomous vehicles there, relieve the streets from all the congestion of all that travel, put it in the robo taxi subway system, right? And then the, the cars can efficiently travel through the city and then come up and then go to the actual destination that you want to go to potentially. Right. Right now, right now, the vehicles are constrained within the, the Vegas boring tunnel system, but perhaps eventually they won't be. They'll come out of that, the system and then go on the surface streets to mm -hmm. your final destination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the potential there is, is quite uh, interesting long term for many cities that have not invested billions of dollars in their subway systems. Yeah. And I guess if, if public transportation became irrelevant at some point, the subways could be converted to... Uh, to uh, handling uh, uh, robo taxis, potentially, yeah, that would be interesting to see if they could be uh, redeveloped that way. Sure, yeah, they might be larger than they need to be, but but still, if those tubes are there, right. they could be reused. Yep. 
the other thing this does is it relieves um, congestion and pollution in cities. It will make cities more livable, right? To the extent that robo taxis replace internal combustion vehicles, get them off the road. We've got autonomous EVs ferrying people around. So it'll make living in downtowns more attractive and it might re help revitalize some downtown areas. I could also see it work the other way where it makes living out in the suburbs also attractive because now you've got a more efficient way of transportation into the city. Mm -hmm. So some people have argued that residential real estate in the suburbs might see a price decline. Maybe, I'm not so sure. It might actually also make that more interesting or more, more appealing. Mm -hmm. But at the very least, I agree. I think it would make living downtown more appealing for a lot of people. Less congestion, less noise, less pollution uh, exactly. is a good thing. So that's something too. Robotaxi will also undercut vehicle ownership. And you were mentioning this personally, you're down to one vehicle. Um, for a lot of people that have two vehicles, they could certainly easily go down to one or, or eventually none. If you can get the cost of the Robotaxi network down to a level that is so cheap, you just can't pass it up. And right. if it's so reliable, then why would you bother owning a vehicle? Okay. So yeah, for you, and it's not just and it's not just at my end of the age scale either. We see young people who are opting out not to own a vehicle. Um, my twenty-eight-year-old son um, is still owning two vehicles for their family, but just barely. He works from home also, uh, even though he works for a large corporation. He works from home, and um, he doesn't really need that second vehicle. He has it purely as a convenience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one would be an easy one to, to let go at some point, for sure. Yeah. I don't know what percentage of American households have more than one vehicle, but it's probably quite a large number. I think so, yes. And then um, just in terms of the cost savings, right? Here's sort of a breakdown by income group, how much people spend on transportation services, cost of the vehicle, gas, bus fare, all that stuff. And it's a pretty significant chunk of money for the average person. Uh, I think on average, it works out to about $10,000 per year per person. Uh-huh. Right? But averages don't tell the full story. Certainly higher income group groups are spending a lot more than that. Right. Huh. Interesting. So for the average household, it's about 16% of their income is spent on transportation. Right. And and interestingly, even though the dollars are much higher for the higher income individuals, the percentage is lower. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily scale up with income to a point it does. People buy yes. more expensive yes. cars and do more trips. But at some point, the extra income more than makes up for those extra expenses. Very so there's a pretty significant opportunity here for, for some cost savings. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what this really means is this, is that if you find a way to reduce your transportation cost, you're going to repurpose, re you're going to spend that money on something else. It's economic stimulus for the rest of the economy. So if you are in any other industry besides transportation, you should be cheering for the development of a robotaxi network because more of that money can come to you, right? If you are a contractor that does home renovations and you can convince people to get rid of their vehicles, they now need to renovate that garage into something else. And the and the groundskeepers, I mean, sorry, the uh, the um, uh, getting rid of the driveway will provide more opportunity for for lawn keeping. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So there's all kinds of economic stimulus and development that will come because of that over time. Um, so it's like economic stimulus each and every year mm -hmm. for the rest of the economy, making transportation more efficient. So right. that's an economic benefit across the board. Now, we've talked about this. It makes FSD-capable automobiles, whether they're Teslas or other companies, if they license FSD, it makes them more valuable because what you're doing is you're turning a depreciating machine into a money printer, right? Per Brett Winton, James Dalma, my projections, others. Right. 
And I've done some initial work that shows, depending on your assumptions, you, your car might appreciate by 40% or it might even double in value mm -hmm. or more, depending mm -hmm. on what your assumptions are in right. terms of how, how much it could be utilized and how long it could be in service in a robotaxi. So this is something to understand. Anybody that has a used Tesla that's FSD capable could unlock some tremendous value even if you don't want to put it in a robo taxi network yourself, somebody will want to, and they'll come knocking on your door saying, can I please buy your car for twice the price that you think right. it's worth? Right. Okay. And then the flip side of that is it further devalues everything else. Yes. Right. Vehicles that are not FSD capable, other automaker vehicles that decided not to license FSD, it makes their vehicles even less useful because they're just depreciating machines for sure. Mm -hmm. it will depreciate even faster yeah and it's go and uh you know some people might immediately be thinking well how come this didn't happen uh as a result of uh of um uh uber or of turo um you didn't see you know used car prices go up well in both of those cases you have a very high labor expense so in the one case you have the labor expense in the car driving around in uber's case in the Turo case, I've done it with a couple of my cars, and there's a very high labor expense in terms of picking people up, dropping them off, go, you know, going to airports, um, washing the cars, preparing the cars, working with the client when they when they're when they're picking the car up to make sure they understand the car, walk around it to make sure there's no dents. So there's a there's a lot of labor still involved in a Turo invo in, in in involvement, um, and with this one. No, you turn it loose and you don't, you may not ever see it again. It just, the checks just keep coming in. That's right. I would imagine if somebody did an economic study of the effect of, of Turo and Lyft and Uber, that they probably would have detected a bump in used car values. But, a but bump. This, this is a true game changer in terms of, yeah, a, a shift in value. Yeah. And then the big thing, we've talked about this, but the big thing is it gives your time back. So it's not just an economic benefit, although this is also an economic benefit potentially, right? And this is from Peter Diamandis yesterday. He said that the average commuter spends 52 minutes each day round trip trapped in their vehicle, mm -hmm. right? So that's equivalent to recovering 216 hours a year, okay? Or 27 eight-hour days of time. Right. And the most valuable thing that we all have is time. Right. And so to recover that is great. So you could choose to be more productive with this. You can make the vehicle your mobile office. Mm -hmm. You could choose to take a nap, which is great. You could choose to hang out with your friends, talk on your phone, post on X, play video games. That's all. That's all great. That's that's fantastic. Right. If people want to do that. So this is something too not not to underestimate the value of giving people their time back. Yeah, because yeah. driving a car, as fun as it might be for some people, for a lot of people, it's just drudgery. Well, and uh, I can think uh, quite quickly in terms of the the salesperson who works out of their car. Um, you know, I've I've made as many as twenty calls in a day. But even let's say on an average, maybe an average salesperson makes six calls a day if they're doing sales from their automobile. Um, if you're able to make that time in between those calls productive, that'd be mm -hmm. huge. That's right. Yeah. And then the effect on automakers. So we, we all know about economies of scale. As a company scales up, whatever fixed cost of production they have, it's spread out over more and more vehicles, and therefore the cost, that fixed cost per unit goes down. Well, put that in reverse. You're gonna have diseconomies of scale. So as these automakers make fewer and fewer vehicles, right? Because we won't need as many vehicles in a robotaxi world because the utilization of each vehicle is five or six times as much. Right. The automakers need to start shrinking their businesses, even, even if they shift to EVs, even if they make that shift. Right. That's one thing, but whatever it is, the industry as a whole won't need as many EVs to be produced. And so they're still going to have the same high fixed cost, 
But if you average that out over fewer and fewer vehicles, then the, that fixed cost per unit is is bigger. Right. So this little, little table here works in reverse. Yes. Okay. And don't underestimate the impact of that because here is GM's income statement and how it looks visually. If you go all the way to the top right, the net profit is only a 5% margin. It doesn't take much for that to go negative. Right. If the volume of vehicles that they produce starts to decline rapidly. Mm hmm they're still going to have the same fixed cost of running their factories and that 5% margin now is not going to carry them very far. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So bankruptcy courts uh, start to get busy, essentially. What it also might mean is that if you do want to buy a vehicle from one of these companies that is not producing robo-taxi capable vehicles, it could get very expensive because if for GM to survive, they're either going to have to cut costs, and again, they have to close factories, or they're going to have to raise their prices. You're going to have to pay more because they've got fewer vehicles to spread that cost over. So the, the cost of you know, doing something different is going to get expensive. And the other way to put it maybe is the cost of status. If, if driving a car becomes a status symbol that fewer people can afford, it's only going to get more and more expensive. Yeah. So that's kind of like the Ferrari model, right? Where they have 50% gross margins instead of GM's 15% gross margins. I don't know if you're going to get into this, but I've commonly thought about the, the tremendous disruption and what that's going to look like in terms of the used car market. So whether it's the ICE revolution, I mean, getting rid of ICE or whether it's getting rid of drivers, you know, as both of those are happening at the same time, used car values in general, if they're not electric and if they're not uh, capable of FSD, then are capable of being put in the robotaxi market, then their values are going to drop significantly. Except what do we know about supply and demand as the price goes down, somebody who might have been ready to make the switch into only using robo taxis is going to say oh well if i can get that ten thousand dollar car for four thousand dollars i'm going to i'm going to stay in the driving business uh for now even though i could save money on my time i mean you know save save money by utilizing my time better um i'm for that price no i've, I've still got to stay so there's going to be this shifting around this uh, yeah. for probably 10 or 20 years of where the used car market for ICE and non-FSD vehicles is going to be uh, quite interesting to watch. There certainly could be. I think the transition will happen fairly rapidly because I think it'll be hard for these big companies to maintain a going concern status. It's yeah. really hard to properly shrink your company down to the size that it needs to be. Right. It's a very hard thing to do. Yeah, the, uh, big, the big thing, that, the big unknown, maybe you're going to address this, but the big unknown, we really don't know. And Kathy Wood is, you know, his, her group is trying to trying to figure it out, is will there be a dramatic increase in the use of vehicles at these prices? Uh, even though the vehicles go five times as far, will the lower cost and the lower, that, and the easy method of doing this, uh, Elon has talked about replacing short hop, airplane flights. People would much rather get in a car and go what might be a one hour airplane trip is really a three and a half hour airplane trip. By the time you drive there, um, go through a security check, blah, 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 wait for the thing to take off. You, If you could get that in that same situation, you can get there in six hours by car um, and you can rest or play a game or whatever and see the scenery how many people will switch to that vehicle approach rather than take that short, short, short hot airplane. Lots of examples like that could increase fairly dramatically the number of miles driven. And I have a slide for that coming up. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Jumped ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all good. Let's talk about insurance. And we talked about this particular chart yesterday. Um, the reality is Americans are dreadful drivers. Uh huh. And the chart, the large chart in the lower lower right, compares the United States to twenty seven other high income countries, and the number of 
vehicle crash deaths per 100,000 population. Right. So trying to population adjust this. The United States, you can see the two dots from 2015 and 2019 sit right on top of each other. There's been no improvement during that time period. Mm -hmm. Most of the other countries saw some improvement for the better. Right. And at the very least, we're, we're out there on that skinny branch. We're further out. We have more, more deaths per 100,000 population. So we're more distracted. You know, maybe the roadways here are just not as safely built or constructed. Whatever, whatever it is, all those things together, um, we're, we're terrible drivers. And it's driving up our insurance costs in the lower left. Right. And we talked about that yesterday as well in terms of, you know, 22% increase in insurance rates year over year. Right. And and again, if people want to go back and look at it, I'll put a, a card up at the end. But we talked in detail. There's a bunch of other factors uh, besides being terrible drivers that are driving those insurance rates up, yep. which, which which should cause some modification in future years. But at the same time, they're still high. <laughs> still high. And so the implications then of a robo-taxi network is you're going to have more and more EVs on the road which should be safer. So there should be less accidents. But right now, EVs are more expensive to repair yep. than non-EVs. And so just by having more on the road, the overall aggregate cost to insurance companies might go up. So we might have pressure on insurance rates because of that too. Right. Although an individual EV owner might actually see their insurance rates come down but just in aggregate, the cost of repair for the insurance companies might go up for a period of time. Um, so there could be some interesting adjustments too in the insurance industry. And then the thing that I worry about a little bit is this whole uninsured motorist problem that we already have. In the state of Florida, it's estimated that about 25% of people drive with no insurance. Right. Which is unbelievable. And if insurance continues to go higher, more and more people will opt out of buying insurance. They just can't afford it. They still have to drive to get to work, but they can't right. afford the insurance. So they say, you know what? I'll take the risk. Right. And so at that point, if this problem becomes much worse, to me, you start getting into the situation where perhaps some of the regulators are tempted to say, you know what? We, we have to ban human drivers because it's just too dangerous. Right. Now, it might not be banning human drivers all the time. It might be just during rush hour or on certain roads. You can't go on the interstate if you're a human driver. It's too dangerous to be driving 90 miles an hour and be distracted. The consequences of that are too catastrophic, right? And we can make interstate travel that much more efficient if it's all robo-taxis, for right. example. Right. Or if it's rush hour or the downtown core of certain cities or even to certain streets, mm -hmm. robo-taxi only so that they're extremely efficient. You put the human drivers on other roads where they can clog up the traffic and get distracted and crash into each other. Right. Fine. But we have these arteries in our cities that are extremely efficient arteries. Right. This is going to be interesting to watch, the insurance part of this. Sure. Uh, and kudos to the drivers in Maine. Only four and a half percent of you don't buy insurance. So <laughs> well done, Maine. Okay. The other big thing is traffic fatalities. In this country, we lose 42 to 44,000 people a year um, to traffic accidents, fatalities. Mm -hmm. This does not show the number of people that become disabled or injured. Right. And the cost to the healthcare system, the cost to everybody mm -hmm. to treat those people and help them. But the traffic fatalities is shocking. It's like 200 plus Boeing 737s falling from the sky every year and killing everybody. Yeah. It's like one every two days crashing. You, can you imagine if Boeing started to fall from the sky <laughs> at that rate? No one would fly anymore. Every Boeing would be grounded, right? We would not accept it, but yet we accept it when it comes to driving in vehicles. And we accept it because there's no other choice. We we have to go from point A to point B. We have to get to work. We have to do all these things. And so we accept this risk. But we are about to have a new alternative. And so we won't have to accept this risk anymore. And increasingly, I think people are going to be 
you know, more and more upset with this. And there's going to be more political pressure to do something about the rate of accidents, whatever that is, mm -hmm. right? At the extreme, it's banning human drivers, period. Right. You want to drive a car, you go to a closed course, fine. Right. You want you, you, you can drive a car, but you, you're going to have to go somewhere where it's safe and it's you're protected from hurting anybody else. So this will be interesting to see how this evolves over time. But we have not had an option. Before we have to we, we have to take that risk today of driving in a vehicle. Sure. But soon we'll have a, a beautiful option to to avoid this risk. And this this is huge. And this is just U.S. data. It's even worse if you look at worldwide data. Yeah. Something like a million people a year die in vehicle mm -hmm. accidents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it's not just deaths from accidents and crashes. It's emissions. The toxic fumes and so on and, and all the stuff. It's estimated in the U.S. it costs about 10,000 lives per year. Right. This is, you know, over time, people are exposed to this stuff and people sure. that live next to the roadways and that kind of stuff. So the, the savings to the healthcare system will be potentially huge over time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is this is from Mark Invest. And then back to your earlier comment about airlines. So Ark Invest says with if you can get prices um with prices ranging from four dollars to twenty-five cents per mile, robo taxis could be a more attractive option than sixty percent of short haul airline flights. Mm. Okay, so short haul flights currently generate one hundred billion or 20% of airline revenues globally. Mm. Okay, so at 50 cents per mile, a robo-taxi service would be less expensive than more than half of short-haul flight airline flights. At 25 cents per mile, it would be cheaper than 95% of short-haul journeys. So yes, this is a disruptive force potentially on airlines over time as well. Right. Because who likes going to the airport early, sitting around, going through security. Why not just take a robot taxi, sleep the whole way or watch a movie. You don't have to deal with security, all the hassles of going to an airport, seeing an airplane, you know, getting bumped at the last minute or whatever, all, the, all those issues. We all know and then, what they are. And then you have to rent a car at the other end. Yeah. You don't have your vehicle. That's right. Yeah. I'm faced, faced with this all the time in uh, Los Angeles area to, to Las Vegas. Uh, it's, it's about four and a half, five hours to drive there. And it's like, it's like this <laughs> yeah. yeah, driver fly, driver fly already given, given if it was a robo taxi, the issue might be almost zero. I recently did a three and a half hour, uh, road trip with Scott Walter to Miami. Yes. yes. And what a pleasure that was. It was like <laughs> listening to a three and a half hour YouTube uh, channel <laughs> right, with Scott Walter. I could ask him any question I wanted to like this. People should be paying Scott, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for that opportunity. <laughs> so yes, that 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 may be an opportunity as well if we can clone Scott. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, so you and I have talked about this before, but the adoption of robo taxi autonomy in general uh, accelerates the decline of service stations. Right now. Service stations today, just to remind folks, they use the gas pumps as a way to draw people into the convenience side of things. The gas pumps don't really make much money for gas stations, if any. It's getting them into the convenience store so they can sell them products, food, services, whatever. Um, in an autonomous world, you don't need the gas stations close to your home because the cars are not going to be fueled or charged there. They're going to be charged somewhere else. And you probably don't need to stop there either because only perhaps on any kind of journey, like of any kind of distance, would you really need to stop at a convenience station? Um, so the convenience stations are gonna have to find ways, ways to reinvent themselves, to make themselves relevant. Um, and the decline of service stations in an autonomous world is rapid because of all the miles that robo taxis will do It'll get all those ice cars off the road. We just don't need as many service stations anymore. Right. So this will be an interesting one to watch. There's already some evidence of companies trying to get out of the service station business, and they're not able to find a buyer for the stations. Mm -hmm. 
and this is why. Right. Okay. Parking. It's estimated that there are between 800 million and 2 billion parking spaces in the United States. It would cover the entire state of Connecticut. There's between three and six parking spaces for every car in the US. I think that's probably low. It seems like there's a lot more than that. <laughs> parking takes up more than one fifth of all land in city centers, 20% of prime locations in city centers. Okay, so we have paved over America. <laughs> and if you want a great video to watch on the history of this, this video, America's Stupidest Parking Secret by Climate Town is an amazing watch on YouTube. Okay. There was no rhyme or reason as to what, the way we designed the parking spaces and, and determined how many we needed. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating watch. But clearly, if vehicles are autonomous and don't need to be parked, they just drop you off, go on to the next ride. They don't need to be parked everywhere. We don't need a football field-sized parking lot in front of every target. Mm -hmm. Right? Or, or bigger. Um, and so this gives us an opportunity to develop the real estate, redevelop the real estate into something use more useful. So in city centers, maybe it's more residential housing. Mm -hmm. Makes those city centers more appealing again. We talked about in homes, your garage, your driveway, you don't need, you can redevelop that. Mm -hmm. Right? So there's a real estate opportunity here as well. And it's a, it's a significant one over a long period of time. And of course, Uber and Lyft have already shown the way on this because there's already a reduction in the needed spaces in downtown areas, especially those around convention centers and and uh, and and uh, entertainment centers. Uh, much way fewer people parking in those areas than used than there used to be, just because of Uber and Lyft. So this will further hit that. Yeah, the economics of parking garages get upended. Parking garages probably can be repurposed to something else. Right. Although the robotaxi network will need a place to charge and clean vehicles, hopefully mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. So some of those parking garages and parking locations could be repurposed for that. But by and large, we wouldn't need nearly as many. The on-street parking that we have in cities, you probably get rid of and you turn them into drop-off or pickup zones. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we don't want the cars stopping in the middle of the street to let the passengers out. But they need to be able to pull over somewhere. Or, you know, short term parking. So, is it, this will be again an interesting, messy yeah. kind of change, right? But one for the better. Okay, here's some bigger ideas. You will be able to talk to your car. Oh, I thought you were going to say that I was going to get all my hair back. Well, there's hope for that, Randy. That's another technology. <laughs> yeah, but not, not part of today's topic. And I, I might be first in line for that. <laughs> Although when I was in Miami, a uh, number of people thought that I was Andre Agassi. I see. Okay. There you go. Yeah. And I'm interested to see now if people are coming up to him and asking him if he's CERN basher. <laughs> anyway, um, this is a big one. And this was teased, obviously, with Knight Rider and Kit, you know, car back in the 80s. But sure. the ability to talk to your car does a number of things. One is... I get a lot of comments from people saying, I'm not comfortable being in a robotaxi. It's going to do things I won't understand. Well, you'll be able to talk to it and say, hey, why did you stop back there? Why did you do what you did? And the car will tell you. And the car may even tell you ahead of time and say, hey, I'm seeing this truck coming on the left. I'm going to suddenly break. <laughs> right? Yeah. It, it won't be a, a lack of communication. If you want the car to tell you what it's thinking, it will tell you what it's thinking. Right. And by the way, you could also tell the car and say, hey, I'm not comfortable with the way you take the corners. You, you go around too fast. Can you slow mm -hmm. down and you take corners or whatever it is? Or you're driving next beside a truck. Can you please just pull back a bit to give me some space? I'm not comfortable driving beside a, a big truck. Sure. Right. Those kinds of things I think will be remarkable. It'll make driving feel so safe because you'll have this conversation with the vehicle. Not only that, Randy, but you can talk to the vehicle and ask it to be any voice or any language you want it to be. So if you want to learn another language while you're driving around Paris, it can teach you French mm -hmm. while you're driving around Paris mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or whatever it is. It could pretend to be your friend, your, your spouse. Your tour guide. 
your tour guide. Up there on the left is a thing we call the Eiffel Tower. That's it right. Was built in this year and by this guy who was trying to find a place to take his love of the love of his life uh, for lunch. And uh, anyway, uh, yeah, yes. you, you could have the tour guide. Yeah. Well, so it opens it up to new, it's a platform for new services. Right. Just like the internet allowed Airbnb and Hotels.com and TripAdvisor to exist and Netflix to exist. Couldn't have done that without the internet. Mm -hmm. This mobile transportation network will also allow other services to exist that couldn't exist before. And the one that you and I have talked about before is this idea of a tour guide, right? You're in a new city, you ask it, show me the sites of the city and explain to me the relevance of, of these sites. Yep. And by the way, you know, at noon, I want to go to a, the best restaurant you can find that has, you know, a certain kind of food. You know, that would be an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. But the question is, what other services now can be layered on top of this RoboTaxi platform? I don't think we can even begin to imagine what that might be. Right. Certainly delivery of, of things. But even beyond that, what what's the next Airbnb mm -hmm. that's on a robo taxi network? I, I don't know that we know what that is yet. Right, maybe the robo taxi actually uh, converts into a, a a very nice bed. You could actually, you know, as opposed to the the seats now that you know it's pretty comfortable. You can I can fall asleep easily in this chair. Um, but maybe it's even more. You're going to be on a four-hour drive, so it will go completely flat with a pillow, you know. Yep. <laughs> and eventually, too, once we get to the point where there's enough robotaxis, we don't have to worry about seatbelts anymore. Yeah. Now, that's that's a long way down the road. It's also at the point we don't have to worry about stoplights and, 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 and um, traffic lights anymore. Right. Stop signs and traffic lights. Right. Right. That's, that's way down the road when pretty much everything's autonomous. We're mm -hmm. not there yet. It's going to be decades. Right. But if you don't have to deal with those safety features, then you can redesign the car in very material ways. Um, you know, some people have asked me, well, how are we going to deal with kids' car seats in a robo taxi? Right. Right. In the short term, we have to figure out a solution. In the long term, it's not going to matter. You just let them roam around the vehicle like we did when I was young. Right. We, exactly. right? <laughs> so we'll go back to that again. And yeah, it'll be safe. It, it, that, that, this would assume that there's almost no accidents anymore because the robo taxis are not only, you know, really, really good at avoiding accidents, but also because they're probably going to be speaking to each other by that point. Um, but I did have this idea. I don't think it was with you. It might have been with Scott of where your airbag might be a single airbag in the middle of the roof or the ceiling, however you want to think of it. And if there is an accident, this massive airbag <laughs> fills up the entire compartment and protects everybody from bouncing into one another as well as from being hurt. So anyway, there might be something like that. Not exactly sure how all that would work, but you might not need the seatbelts anymore if you had something like that. Right. Yeah, there'll definitely be some innovation around all that. Um, and, and we'll see. So... Just to summarize, and I, I think, again, we're still scratching the surface on implications, but it's very clearly there's first order, second order, and third order implications. Mm -hmm. And just to summarize, the first order, it's an entirely new business model for Tesla. Mm -hmm. It undercuts ride share. It reduces vehicle ownership over time. It creates a massive amount of ongoing economic stimulus as you free up money that was spent on transportation into something else in the economy, mm -hmm. right, which is great. It increases the value of FSD capable Teslas or even non Teslas if they license it to anybody, mm -hmm. if any other company is smart enough to do that. And it decreases the value of all other vehicles that are non FSD capable vehicles because the, their utility now is diminished. Right. And the most important, well, one of the most important first order effects, and we shouldn't underestimate this, is it gives back time. Sure. And that, that's valuable to people. And I think. We will see that very clearly. Second order, automaker diseconomies of scale. The more successful a robotaxi network is, the quicker these automakers run into trouble. Right. Okay, and they already have with the transition to EVs, but this is a further accelerant to that. 
status may become more expensive if, if status means you know a, a fancy car that i can drive um auto industry adapts there's going to be some challenges there saving lives this this is tesla and elon's gift to humanity and one of the things that elon will be remembered for is this gift mm -hmm. I'm, I'm certain of it in the history books right He's the guy that solved the problem of humans killing themselves driving vehicles on the road. How stupid were those people to subject themselves to that risk? He's the guy that fixed it. Okay. It's going to take ICE vehicles off the road, which is good for you know Tesla's mission in terms of advancing towards sustainable energy. It will destroy service station economics. Some of the service stations will adapt and adjust and become relevant. Others will just go away. And again, there's a real estate redevelopment opportunity there too. Mm -hmm. Okay. It reduces the need for parking, real estate redevelopment opportunity. That's in the next column, third order, real estate redevelopment opportunities. We just talked about two of them, residential garages, residential driveways, more livable cities. The list goes on. It impacts airlines, it impacts hotels. It's going to massively reduce healthcare costs. We're going to have faster, more efficient transportation. It will boost productivity because people can do other things in the vehicles, right? And even if it's sleeping in the vehicle, then you might be more productive when you sure. arrive at your destination. So that's that's okay too. And then finally, and this is a big one, and we don't really know what this looks like yet. It's going to unlock new business opportunities that sit on top of the RoboTaxi platform, right? And maybe along with humanoid robots, the combination of those two unlocks something that's pretty amazing. Yeah, and if you have a humanoid robot that you're interacting with, its brain can come along with you in the vehicle. That's true. Yes. <laughs> right. And it has a memory. So it's not like you get in the vehicle and doesn't know who you are. The vehicle knows exactly who you are and exactly what you like and what you want and where you're going and your preferences and everything. Yes. Yeah. Right. It was, so it, it, that's interesting, too. Yeah, because you're on the app and the app has your history. So you're yeah. you're going to be a, the the vehicle will know you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that'll be what a what a what a time we're entering into. It's gonna it's just uh, absolutely incredible to think about. Um, so what have we left anything out? That would be the question of the day for down for people to comment on. Is there more changes that we have left out of this? Uh, when I say we, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that CERN has left out. I didn't have anything to do with putting this together at all. So has CERN left anything out that we should be looking at that's uh, important? Uh, is there things that you uh, think are crazy that, no, it's not going to happen? Um, or things that you think are orders of magnitude off one way or the other? Um, so CERN, uh, have, has, did anything pop into your mind while we were doing this that you thought, oh, you know, I should have put this in? Well, the thing to say too is, a lot of people get hung up on time frames and they say, ah, this will never happen. Well, I don't know when some of this will happen, but it is very clear to me that we're going to be moving to an autonomous vehicle world. Right. And maybe it takes longer than, than we think. And maybe this announcement in August is just the beginning of this pilot programs and it takes years. I don't know. But if we think through the implications to me, th these are all pretty clear. Yeah. And certainly, I'm sure I've missed some. I'd love to hear of other ideas. Mm -hmm. And then, Randy, from you, was this the best presentation ever? Did I did I meet that objective? Well, it, we, so, so you know, how are we judging it? Are we judging it based on color and attractiveness of presentation? Are we talking about the depth of understanding? Are we talking about the futurism, the ability to uh, construct a future world? I mean, you know, I think uh, maybe maybe as a total package, then, you know, let's ask the folks, comment below. Is this CERN's best ever? And if if not, then I'll have to just keep improving my game. <laughs> just keep, you have to do that anyway, sir. And that's a, it's a requirement of staying on the channel. I mean, you know, that's and I right. know it's very important to you to stay on my channel. <laughs> All right. Well, CERN, as always, uh, you've brought it. You've brought the. You brought your A game. You've brought us information and ideas and ways of thinking about things that uh, that are really important. I mean, I, people have. I know I've. I've probably talked about this before on the channel. I did a kind of a a study about this. People, I think everybody should be as interested in the future as I am. 
And um, the vast majority of the folks in the world do not want to hear about the future because when they are listening to all this good stuff, they're going, oh, there goes my job. Or, oh, what will I do when that happens? Or, I kind of like my car. Or, you know, I really, really have enjoyed sucking in those fumes at the gas pump all these years. <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, I like the smell of the gasoline station. I saw that the other day, one of the top uh, supercar manufacturers, Lamborghini or somebody like that said, their customers still want car sounds and smells. And I thought, wow, yeah. <laughs> I well, get sound a little bit because we boys always like our, boom, boom, boom. you know, we even make the noise with our, um, so I kind of get the sound a little bit. Although I kind of am impressed right now with the sound of silence when mm -hmm. I accelerate from zero to 75 or 80 in a few feet <laughs> and it's all done silently. There's kind of a power in that. <laughs> That's right. Um, there's certainly some people that derive some significance from the sound of their vehicles and the, the loudness of their stereos. That's right. Um, the vast majority of people, that is not what, makes them feel significant on the, on this earth um and that's fine they they can they can do that for a period of time and that that's great um but i think you know whether or not you want to change change is coming it always right. does yes nothing ever stays stays the same right and so for that reason i like to think about what that might be i i'm probably wrong on on half of it but right. it doesn't stop me from thinking about it no, it's fun. I really enjoy it. Um, and hopefully you guys did too. Let us know in the comments below. And CERN, again, as always, thank you for bopping by and providing us with all this cool stuff. And uh, to all of you out there, it's been great talking to you. Thanks, Randy.